We are at week two, or three now, in a sermon series that we framed at the beginning of the year on everyday acts of courage, and to discuss racial equity and justice, how we are saying yes or no to the call that Dr. King so, uh, voiced so well to America, it doesn't seem like an everyday act of courage. In my mind, I see the novel in which a pilgrim on the path is walking along and out of the blue, a ray of light shines from heaven onto their face. They hear the call very clearly. It's easy to say yes because it was God. They do. They succeed in their goal and everything is wrapped up nice and tidy. In my life, it is absolutely 100% never gone that way. There's twists and turns. I usually say no a thousand times before I say yes, and then no again. The favorite story of mine from the biblical scriptures that illustrates that is the one of Jonah and the fish, which I'm sure many of you remember, maybe from Sunday school as a child. In the Hebrew scriptures, uh, if you go home and check your Bible in mine, mine, it's one page long, this story, so it's an easy read. Jonah's walking along, and God comes to Jonah and says, Hey, Jonah, get up and go to Nineveh. I'm upset with them, and I'd like you to go and tell them that I'm mad and they need to repent of their injustice and wicked ways. So you know, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It's in modern-day Iraq, one of the most powerful empires in the world and Israel's enemy. So here, God has asked Jonah to walk into the capital city of the most powerful empire on earth, his enemies, walk right into the middle and say, hey y'all, you're about to be destroyed if you don't change all your ways, thanks very much. And so Jonah does what I would do. He said, no. (laughs) Turned around, literally in the opposite direction, gets a boat out of town, buys a ticket, gets on the boat, and heads the other way. While he's on the water in the middle of the sea, a great and terrible storm comes and disrupts the water. The boat he's on is being rocked left and right, splashing the waves over, and the boat is about to capsize, and the people on it drown, and the sailors are frightened. They cast lots to see who has done something to merit this storm. They go down and find Jonah asleep. They wake him up and say, did you do this? And he says, oh, I forgot to mention, I am running away from the God Yahweh who has called me to a very important task. (laughs) I think if you throw me overboard, this will fix your problems. The the, uh, sailors take Jonah on his advice, throw him over the boat where he is famously swallowed in the belly of a big fish, where he sits for three days thanking God in the form of a long psalm, a prayer and song. And then in my favorite translation of the scripture, it says that a fish vomited Jonah onto the seashore. (laughs) When he gets himself up, sloppy and wet, covered with fish vomit on the seashore, who's there waiting for him on the sand? God, who says, get up and get to Nineveh. Jonah does this time goes into the capital city of the most powerful enemy empire and says, you had better change your ways. And then something miraculous happens. They do. Everybody, from the king on down, changes all of their wicked, unjust ways, wears sackcloth and ashes, fasts, and God says, we are good. Jonah is not happy. He runs out into the desert screaming at God, I knew you would do this. You're always forgiving and merciful and kind and patient. I knew you would forgive them when you asked me. That's why I said no. (laughs) He goes and pouts under a vine, which God sends a worm to eat. So the hot sun is shining on his sweaty, angry, pouting face. And God, in one of my favorite non-closure moments of the Bible, says, Really? And that's how it ends. No closure at all, just this impudent little man, (laughs) angry and upset that when he finally said yes to what he believed he was called to do, things worked out and people were well. That feels a lot more like my life. 
than the easy, simple story. And when I think about America responding to the call of racial equity and justice that King voiced so well and is alive today, I think it feels a lot more like that journey than the easy, tidy, convenient, safe narrative that I grew up taught about Dr. King in a public school in Grand Prairie, Texas. It's easy to forget how deeply unpopular he was in his own life. Disapproval ratings at 75% by whites and 55% by black Americans. It's easy for those of us who grew up with his name on a holiday to forget that he was called by the counterintelligence director of the FBI the most dangerous black man in America. That our FBI with our tax dollars spied on him, provided tapes of alleged affairs to his wife, wrote him a letter encouraging him to commit suicide in a few days or they would release the details. It's tempting for people in my generation who grew up with his face on a postage stamp to forget the man who was going to lead an Occupy movement at the Capitol, the Poor People's Campaign, who campaigned against what he called the evil triplets of militarism, materialism, and racism the man who had more critiques of white moderate churches than perhaps even of white nationalists in his day. He thought that we were wishy-washy people who critiqued ways of doing things instead of actually getting out and putting our bodies on the line. And I think as America, looking at this narrative, it is so tempting for us to want to be Nineveh. The people who heard they were doing wrong decided to do right, did it quickly, and had no consequences. When more often we are a lot more like Jonah, who hear an important and transformative call, say no and yes and no and yes, stumble and find ourselves waking up in the midst of a terrible storm, soaked on the seashore with a God who says, get back to Nineveh. This week, the poet Mary Oliver, sometimes considered a patron saint of Unitarian poetry, <laughs> died. And one of her most famous lines that those of us can recite from memory is at the end of one of her poems in which she says, tell me what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? That's a big question saying yes to the call in the way that she frames it, raises the stakes if you think you've only got one life. And so whether it's a commitment to racial equity and justice, whether it's devoting yourself to a family or a child or forgiveness and compassion, the decision about what you say yes to matters so much. The poet David White, in the words that we heard this morning, lifted up the fact that anything that's worth saying yes to is going to disturb us and nourish us all at the same time. Our task in saying yes to the call is not to say yes to Dr. King, a great man who is now, as one poet put it, safely in the grave where he can disturb us no more. Our task is not to say yes to one man and his life, but to say yes to what called him, to be disturbed and nourished all at the same time. If you're wondering what's worthy of saying yes to in your life, imagine yourself walking out in your front yard or in a park in the middle of the night. You're at the end of your rope and tears in your eyes and you feel like you can't go on. What is it that you would call out to in the night and say, get down here, I need you? With a capital letter like it was your friend's name. Healing, I need you. Justice, get here now. Forgiveness, I need you with me. If you could put a capital letter in front of, it, front of it, call out to it like a friend in the middle of the night. If it would nourish you and disturb you, turn your life upside down and fill you up again, it might be worthy of being a call. You'll know it's worthy of saying yes to also if you cannot outsource it to anybody else. 
If you determine that the call of Dr. King, the call for racial equity and justice, might still be something we have to contend with, if you believe that it might provide disruption and wholeness for human lives, if you believe that forgiveness or compassion, grace, generosity, courage is something that all humans need to be whole and healed, then the line of that pain and healing runs right through you. If you believe something is good medicine for all people, then you're the one who's called to deliver it. You can't outsource the healing of the world to anybody else. And that to me is more frightening than almost anything else. Because it's nice to have a martyr to do our work for us. A hero safely in the grave. Even if it's just forgiveness or compassion, even if it's the call to care for a young life as a parent, it would be nice to pay somebody else to do my work for me. I think one thing that keeps me and a lot of people from diving headfirst into the challenging work of justice or a call in our lives is the idea that there's only one way to say yes well. In the poem that Reverend Cantor read this morning, the young black poet states that as a black kid growing up in the United States, he thought there's really only two ways for him to be of use in the world, play ball or play dead. He only saw two options for how his life and body could be used for the good, and that is injustice in and of itself. That a society would restrict the possibility of a young person so much that they believe their body could only be useful if given away entirely. His models of Malcolm and Martin and Jesus all on their respective cross. I think those sort of binaries, though, and restricted possibility live in the hearts and minds of people with privilege as well. Think of the ways that we are taught about doing great things, fighting for causes of justice, or really giving our life to forgiveness and compassion. It's all binaries. I have internalized this message that you can either be great or healthy. You better give all your time to these causes. You better give all your money to these causes. If you want to be a great warrior for social justice, your children will resent you for the rest of your life because you'll never, ever see them again. You can be great, or as my wife said to me this week, the tension, the feeling between being great or being whole. You can be on the front lines of justice, or you can be a good parent. That tension that we always give ourselves a binary, this or that. There are many ways to say yes to a good thing. There are many ways to deliver good medicine and many instruments needed in a symphony. One of the things that also keeps people like me from jumping into the work is the fear of doing it imperfectly. And I will tell you, anything worth saying yes to by definition, is so hard that we will mess up and fail and say yes and no and yes and no and stumble and get swallowed by a fish sometimes and vomited on the shore. Anything worth saying yes to, you have to say yes to over and over and over again. At least in my life, redemption and transformation and healing have very rarely been one-time occurrences where I took the forgiveness pill and never had to call my doctor again. Where we just all went to that one justice seminar and afterward, everything was fine. My guess is, if you're like me, you have failed in important ways in the most critical calls of your life. Or else they wouldn't be critical calls. My guess is that if you've committed yourself to justice and tried to do a good job, you have stumbled and said the wrong thing, and like we heard from our task force today, hurt people's feelings and messed up and felt ignorant. My guess is that if you think forgiveness is truly worthy of your life service, that you have struggled with forgiving people. Maybe the marriage didn't turn out the way you thought. Doesn't mean you said no to love. Maybe the bill didn't get passed. It doesn't mean you said no to justice. The question is not whether you said no once or failed, but whether you have a yes left in you. 
And for Americans, as we look upon the legacy of white supremacy, the realities of racial bigotry and bias and injustice that are so present in our world today, we have so many yeses left in us. When just in the past two weeks, we have a member of Congress who wondered why white supremacy is such a bad thing. God stands with her hands on her hips at the shore and says to us, get back to Nineveh. When we have young men this week, mostly white, with a political slogan on their hats and shirts, taunting a native elder at an indigenous people's march, God stands with her hands on her hips and says to us, get back to Nineveh. When churches and synagogues are not bombed and shot up in 1965, but 2018 and 19 in the name of hate, God stands with her hands on her hips at the shore and says, get back to Nineveh. When Nazis march in the streets and are called, some of them very nice people, God stands with her hands on her hips at the shore and says, get back to Nineveh. Do we have a yes left in us? One of the things that I think challenges us often is that we focus in justice work or in saying yes to truly important things on the sense of obligation, on the anger or dismay or despair that comes with these things, and those are real. That's like rocket fuel for justice if you use it well. But one of the things we often fail to do is to lift up the real joy that comes in your life when you say yes to the right things. When you say yes to something that is truly worthy of your one wild and precious life, when you make good medicine, you get to take it too. If somewhere in you, you feel that everyone you've ever known needs justice, and you say yes to it, if you say yes to being disturbed and nourished, then I promise you, you get to have a front row seat for the healing of the world. You don't just go to the play, you get to be in the show. You get the joy that comes from watching the pain and the repair of the world run right through you, side by side. You bear witness to the possibility of a better world and your role in it, and that is a joyful thing. My guess is that you have stumbled in that work, like me, and that you have a yes left in you. My guess is that in your personal life, you have stumbled in profound ways when you tried to forgive or give generously, when you tried to give yourself to the power of love or compassion, but my guess is that you have a yes left in you yet. What you love matters so much much. We cannot say yes to all things before we die, and this play will be over before we know it. What you love, what you say yes to, will shape what you believe to be possible. It will change your world and ours. Do you have a yes left in you yet for important things? We shall see. Amen.